Oh, God, I'm always the shortest person in the room. Anybody see me up here? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. I am um, I'm the new kid on the block. I've literally been uh, with AIM Youth Mental Health since uh, March 18th, and I'm so thrilled to be a part of this emerging and mighty organization that's building a movement to deconstruct the stigma around youth mental health and mental health in general. Um, it's a real honor to be here with you. I was not surprised to see so many hands going up in the air. We all are impacted by issues surrounding mental health, and it's especially tragic in youth. To put this into context, imagine if more than one out of four children could not have access to cancer treatments that were so badly needed not to take anything away from the gravity of cancer and the solemnity of that issue. But do you see what I mean? We would be out in the streets and when we can deconstruct the stigma behind that, we can say, uh, I, am not, I am not my mental health condition. I'm not anxious, I'm awesome. Oh yeah, and I happen to have anxiety. Um, I have OCD, oh yeah, and I'm pretty fantastic. So the opportunity that we have today to learn, to grow, to, to explore hope is amazing. As Susan um, so often refers to this team, you have access to the rock stars of youth mental health from all over the world. Ask them your questions, engage them. I really admire and respect this team and I know you will too. My own motive in this is I see their care, their compassion, and their genuine affinity for having their work be channeled in the interest of children and their health and well-being. I hear that when I speak to them, their care and their compassion come through. This is what makes this team extraordinary. And the fact that you can engage them, where else are you going to find this opportunity? So thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule. You know, the first day that I was with AIM, parents want to tell me their struggles. Teachers, they're desperate for information. They tell me that they're white knuckling it every day. Their babies are suffering. Their children are contemplating sometimes the most unspeakable, unthinkable acts. They're in tears. They want information, their families, need support, and they most of all need hope. And I can tell you that hope just rolled into town this morning. <laughs> so um, I'm pleased to introduce the roster of rock stars this morning. But first, a couple of housekeeping issues. Our friends, our little electronic devices, please put them on silent. Um, if you haven't met her out in the library, Lindsay Novitsky is our amazing communications manager and uh, she is our social media guru. For this event, she, she, she uh, set up a hashtag, hashtag aim for answers. So if you happen to be um, hearing something that really resonates with you or a question that you're burning to ask um, or something that just lit you up in this morning, please send it out. We really want to, um, to get the word out about what's going on here. And, and lastly, I just want to, to, uh, to say that some of what you hear today may trigger some emotions for some of you in the audience. Um, usually you'll get an advance warning of that, but just know if you're starting to feel uncomfortable, please just feel, step to, feel free to step out into the lobby. We, we want to make sure that you're, you're feeling good about the information that you, you get here. Our first speaker, Dr. Walter Kay, is um, unfortunately having to leave uh, right after his talk. So he wants to make sure that you feel good about getting your questions and, and comments addressed. So out in the lobby, you may have noticed that we have some sheets to um, explore your questions and comments with the, with the physicians that you'll hear from tonight. And um, if you will make a point to get your questions to Dr. K, he'll address them directly at the end of his presentation, okay? So with that, I want to get started because I know you're eager to hear from Dr. K. Many of you are here for his talk specifically. 
Dr. K is the director of, of the UC San Diego Eating Disorder Treatment and Research Program, where he and his clinical team treat anorexia nervosa and other eating disorders with innovative, intensive programs that approach the problem on multiple levels, including medical, psychological, psychosocial, educational, and counseling of the family as a, a key support group. And I, I love this about Dr. K. That, that family unit is so integral in a child's well-being, and you're going to hear that come through in his talk. Dr. K's current research is focused on exploring the relationship between brain and behavior using brain imaging and genetics and developing and applying new treatments for anorexia and bulimia nervosa. He has an international reputation in the field of eating disorders and is the author of more than 300 articles and publications. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Walter K. Let's see, uh, good, this is working. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, yeah, Susan and Mark and Cheryl. Uh, you know, this is just a phenomenal organization that they're starting and it's so important because we, the resources and the understanding of child and adolescent uh, behavioral disorders is really you know, inadequate and you know, we, need, we need community support. Uh, I also want to mention that you may want to move down uh, towards the front. The, you know, the, uh, the, the type on the slides may be a little bit small and, uh, and a little bit hard to read, but let me go ahead and get started. And I'm going to talk about uh, some understanding and what we're learning about treatment for anorexia and bulimia and another disorder called uh, ARFID. So these are the disorders that I'm going to uh, cover today and talk a little bit about the phenomena and the etiology, but mainly talk about about treatment. Um, you know, this is obviously food. For most of us, this is, this is rewarding. Um, and you know, there's something about food that really is, uh, doesn't have the same kind of rewards for people with anorexia nervosa. And I like to warn people about the next image because it's very disturbing. And this is a lady that we had, I had treated actually uh, when I ran the program at the National Institute of Mental Health uh, many years ago. She, when she came in the hospital at this point, she was 55 pounds, which is about half of what her weight should be. It should have been 110 pounds. Um, and even at this weight, she saw herself as being too fat. She stayed in the, the hospital. We had an inpatient unit there. She stayed there literally for months getting her weight back went home and relapsed. And we readmitted her several times to the NIMH, and then when I went to the University of Pittsburgh, uh, she lived relatively close by. We admitted her another several times. Same story over and over again. She'd gain weight, she'd get back to a healthy body weight, she'd go home and she'd lose it. And uh, a little bit, you know, when she was about 32 years old, she died from anorexia. And unfortunately, this is all too common that uh, this has the highest death rate of any behavioral disorder. So we, we treat you know, basically three subtypes of, of anorexia or bulimia. There's anorexia itself, which is AN on the slide. There's bulimia nervosa, which tends to be uh, in people who are more or less at normal weight, they don't lose a lot of weight. And then there's anorexia and bulimia together um, and uh, where people may have both restricted eating and also they binge and purge. These tend to be disorders of women. Uh, of course, the anorexia by definition, people lose weight. Uh, there's, this, there's a group of people with anorexia that just purely restrict. And these tend to be kind of very over-controlled kind of people. And then we see people with bulimia, actually, interestingly enough, they, they kind of alternate between overeating and undereating. And emotionally and control-wise, they tend to be kind of the same. They kind of alternate between being overwhelmed with emotions and poor impulse control, and then there's times when they're restricted in their emotions and they have good impulse control. It just makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, but these disorders run together in families. So you can have one family member with anorexia and one with bulimia. And I'm going to talk mostly about anorexia today. Um, this, these disorders have the onset uh, usually around mid to, uh, mid to early adolescence, often around puberty. Uh, anorexia, of course, uh, become severely emaciated often, um, and they see themselves as being too fat, um, and they fear uh, gaining weight. 
Uh, and despite this, uh, you know, not being able to eat very much, they're preoccupied with food. They think about it all the time. They collect recipes. They window shop for food. Uh, they cook for others. And it's just one of those puzzling symptoms that we don't quite understand. But the thing that really makes anorexia such a difficult disorder is people don't see themselves as having a problem. Now, kind of typically, if you have a child that's depressed or anxious, you know, they feel bad. They don't want to have these feelings. They, they want help, you know, often. And, and this is, anorexia is very different because they may be very depressed and, and anxious, but they don't see themselves as having a problem. They don't want help. And if you try and get them to gain weight, uh, you know, it's very kind of difficult for them. Um, and the other thing is that we don't have any proven treatments to actually reverse these kind of core symptoms. We're doing better in terms of treating people, and I'll tell you why, but we don't really, you know, cure people. And the course is that, you know, the good news is that about a half of people with anorexia will eventually have a good outcome. And, uh, but it may take five or 10 years. They may be, they may relapse over and over again. And interestingly enough, when people with anorexia recover, they tend to do really well in life. Some of the traits that get them in trouble, if they use them in positive ways, they actually, you know, can really accomplish a lot. There's another group, about 30%, that remains chronically ill, though. And again, we have this high death rate where 5 or 10% or more people will die. They will starve themselves to death or the suicide or other, other reasons for dying. So we have a new understanding of eating disorders because the conventional notion of anorexia is this is psychosocial in nature. Uh, but actually, eating disorders run in families. And that doesn't really answer the question of whether this is learned or this is genetics, but there's ways of teasing these things apart. And without going into details, I can tell you that for eating disorders, uh, genes play a really major role. They're actually more important than, than culture is, although human behavior is complicated. And it's always an interaction and mixture of, of, of environment and and, and genetics that really you know, contributes to causing things. Uh, but you know, we, while we're, it's, we haven't discovered the genes, we know that there are genes involved. And what genes probably do is they probably contribute to certain traits that you often see in childhood with people who end up developing anorexia. These tend to be anxious, perfectionistic, achievement-oriented, sometimes obsessive. Um, children that kind of worry about uh, consequences. Uh, and those are, you know, not everybody has those traits develops an eating disorder, but those tend to be vulnerabilities that somehow turn into anorexia or bulimia. So let's talk about eating behavior. And actually, when we do treatment of families, we play kind of a form of family feud, not that we want to, but they're, they're actually playing family feud. It's not that it's family feud between families, it's within families. So, you know, the way family feud works is that they ask, uh, you know, they, they do a poll and they, they ask certain questions, they find out what percent of people answer a certain way. So if you're a healthy person, you don't have an eating disorder, what do you think most people say? What do you say when you, when you go without eating for a day or two? How, how does that make you feel? Anybody want to? Perfect, yeah, that, you got the right answer. That's, it's uncomfortable. You know, for most people, not eating, you know, is, is kind of unpleasant. And when you, when you get hungry enough, what happens is that, you know, food becomes rewarding. That first bite of food will taste really good. Um, so that there, there's a reward system and emotions that are built into kind of appetite regulation. Now, what do you think about people with anorexia? What do you, what do you, how do you think they respond to, uh, you know, eating? Well, uh, let me tell you that what most people say is it's exactly the opposite. People with anorexia, there's something about food or thinking about food that makes them uncomfortable, makes them anxious, uh, upset, and that when they starve themselves, when they don't eat, there's something about it that either doesn't increase the anxiety or actually can be kind of rewarding and empowering. So there's some different kind of biology going on here. So we've been doing imaging studies that are trying to answer that question, and because we know that food is, you know, there's a reward center in the brain. It's very important for driving the motivation to eat. We particularly did imaging studies that looked at that reward center. I'm just kind of pointing it out here deep in the brain. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to kind of go into more detail, but let me show you the results in the controls. 
So what we did is we did a study where we brought people into a research setting. We had them stay there for three days. And one day they went without eating for 16 hours. The other day they ate normally. And they came in and they did, we did some brain imaging and we had them taste repeated taste of sugar, which activates the reward center. And just like we expected in the healthy control women that don't have an eating disorder, on the day they were hungry, the reward center responded much more strongly than the day they were full. That's been done in other studies, been done in animals, not surprising. What do you think we found in people with anorexia? Well, it was just the opposite. And then the day that they were hungry, we actually didn't see, uh, we saw a diminished reward response. They actually, interesting enough, on the day they were full, they looked just like the, the control subjects did. So this tells us it's a more complicated study than this, and there's also other uh, aspects that are helping us understand why anxiety is involved. But I just want to kind of point out to you that there's a powerful neurobiology that's going on here that's, that's contributing to these disorders. So how do we treat people with anorexia? Well, you know, William Gulf, who lived, uh, you know, some time ago, actually was one of the persons that said, you know, well, these must be bad parents. You know, we will, we'll do a parent activity. We, we're going to take this child out of the family and we're going to put them in a treatment setting and we're going to get them better and we'll send them back home, you know, cured. Well, of course, that doesn't happen. And what happens in treatment centers is that, uh, yes, you can get people with anorexia at a treatment center to eat and gain weight, but they go back home and the rate of relapse is really high. And so about uh, 15, 20 years ago, the Maudsley Hospital, which is in, in London, uh, was instrumental in developing another kind of treatment, which uh, they call Maudsley or family-based treatment, which what it did is it brought the parents in as allies and said to the parents, you know, basically, you're, you're not bad people. You're not causing this disorder. We want to work with you in alliance and teach you about, you know, understanding your child and actually helping you uh, get this child to eat once they go back home. And so this is a non-blame approach. And because people with eating disorders are, you know, at best ambivalent about treatment, they can be resistant and hostile, um, you know, it's very important to bring the family in. It's often only the family that's really motivated. And, and also families are known and, and familiar to people with eating disorders. And there's something about uncertainty and change and uh, novelty that really increases anxiety in people with eating disorders. So actually it's, it's useful to have the family there because they're familiar and, and to really kind of work with them so that they don't end up in kind of this, uh, you, know, you know, this kind of hostile uh, conflict about eating behavior and teach them, you know, how to, how to manage that. And it, also, this is a long-term illness. It's not that we're trying to put you know, the family, you know, turn this over to the family, but if you're going to be ill for five or ten years, few people can afford to keep somebody with anorexia in the hospital that long. They're going to go home, and the family really know, needs to be empowered and know how to work with their child with anorexia. So the strengths of this is that replicated studies show if you look a year later after treatment, 50% or more of people with anorexia are, are doing well and they're maintaining their weight using family-based treatment, but it tends to be more effective in younger restricting type uh, anorexics. Uh, the older you, you get, it's a little bit harder for families to kind of have this kind of control. Um, it, it's, it's not a perfect treatment. It's actually a very difficult treatment for families to do. Uh, there's a lot of struggles with it. Um, often, uh, you know, it's, it's done often in outpatient uh, settings and, uh, you know, it, when people are really ill with anorexia, they may be too ill to engage. Uh, they may need weight restoration first. Uh, it, and the initial um, family-based treatment was kind of more instinctive. You're the parents, you know how to kind of manage your child. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and there's, there's really very relatively few deeply trained FPT therapists uh, you know, available, especially in smaller communities. Now, what do we do if, uh, if, if uh, FPT doesn't work very well? Well, you know, the slide's a little bit out of order, but it's, the thing that's really essential about treating anorexia is nutritional rehabilitation, weight restoration, because people die, and, you, and this has powerful effects on the brain, and so it's really important to get people back to healthy body weight. Um, and there's things that kind of predict poor outcome, uh, especially extreme anxiety, obsessionality, and, and really impaired family function. One of the things that we're 
doing at San Diego is we're trying to develop a second generation kind of treatment. As we begin to learn more about the neurobiology and the temperament of people with anorexia, we're finding that we can develop you know, more specific targeted kinds of treatment uh, for things like uh, anxiety and, and difficulties with responding to reward and meal behavior and, uh, and, and get families to learn better skills uh, to change this response to anxiety. It really kind of helped them structure the environment and reinforce uh, recovery-oriented behaviors. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about medication. J just to talk a little bit about some of the other disorders, uh, one, one is bulimia nervosa. Uh, because these people don't get as nutritionally uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ill, uh, although they, they do become malnourished to a certain extent, uh, outpatient or partial programs are often, you know, uh, satisfactory to treat them. Um, the two major kind of treatments are one is uh, medications such as antidepressants that have been shown to have some efficacy uh, as well as various kinds of psychotherapy. The, the uh, gold standard is cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, but other therapies have, have been used and there's some evidence that uh, all of these work. Um, both medication and CBT can be very useful in reducing uh, binging and purging behavior, improving function, improving mood. Uh, often uh, they reduce symptoms. They, people don't become abstinent, at least in the short run, from binging or purging. Uh, there's been a number of studies looking at the interaction between CBT and medication because the design of each of the studies was different. It's really hard to come up with a kind of a summary of, of which is better. And it probably, you know, some work for others, one person, others may work for another. Um, Poor outcome is often associated with people that have what we call cluster B, which is really extreme impulse dys dysregulation or substance abuse. Uh, another disorder that we're treating is a relatively newly recognized disorder called avoidant restricted food intake disorder. And the, what this really is, is this is picky eating uh, to an extreme. And this was only really kind of recognized you know, four or five years ago in the most recent version of the DSM. Uh, and, and so we're trying to get, you know, we're trying to understand this disorder better. There's a group of kids that have very extreme picky eating, uh, very limited foods that they might eat, only five foods, or they're very sensitive to textures. Uh, there's a group that have low hunger cues. Uh, they're rarely hungry. There's a group that have kind of phobias. They have a fear of, of swallowing or vomiting or contamination. Uh, so we're dealing with a very mixed group of people here. Uh, this tends to be a younger group of people, uh, average age of, um, that they present for treatment of about 11 years, and uh, they've been ill often a little bit longer than people with uh, anorexia when they present for treatment. And it's uh, up to about 20% are males, so this is a much greater proportion of, of males than do uh, the other eating disorders. We're still trying to kind of figure out treatments. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of studies done yet. Um, the, you know, it's, it's been generally agreed that the treatment needs to be tailored to the symptoms um, and it has to be developmentally sensitive. We've seen children, you know, seven, eight years old in our program. So, and you know, certainly older into teenage years. So that's, they're very different. Um, we have to prioritize the most light threatening symptoms such as white restoration and use a muscle disciplinary report approach. And we're using the, some of the other techniques that we use like family-based treatment or cognitive behavioral therapy uh, on these children and trying to understand how, you know, what works best for them. Just to say something about the eating disorder treatment landscape, there's lots of eating disorder programs out there. Um, they tend to have a very wide kind of perspective and treatment approach. Um, you know, this is a field where uh, people have a lot of different ideas about what causes eating disorders. It's very confusing for families. You go online, you talk to various therapists, you get very different kind of uh, approaches and, and uh, uh, thoughts about the cause. Um, and that's just a struggle that the field is, is, you know, has. And one of the reasons that AIM uh, is, is so important because this is you know, provide, starting to provide the resources to really, you know, come up with a, a science here. Uh, if people fail out treatment, they often need higher levels of care, especially if they're underweight because this can be life-threatening. 
Uh, there's a, a lot of these programs now are private programs. They're owned by private uh, equity kind of companies. They're they're very profitable. Uh, they you know they don't publish their outcomes, and so it's very hard to know if what they're doing is good treatment or not effective treatment. And it's another kind of real weakness in the field is having standards. You, you're going to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Clark today about the UK system. Uh, just, I hope he's going to talk about it to some extent where you know, they've really done a much better job of kind of standardizing treatment and delivering evidence-based treatment than we have in this country. There's relatively few academic programs now. Uh, Stanford and UCSF um, uh, in this area have both have excellent eating disorder programs, um, and, and I would certainly refer you to them. Um, and uh, also, and both of them do FBT. Actually, uh, Daniel Lagrange and Jim Locke, uh, who are at Stanford and UCSD, were the people in this country that brought uh, family-based treatment to this country. So you have really well-trained uh, groups uh, uh, um, in this area. Uh, and there's a number of children's hospital programs too. Most of the time they provide uh, support for medical stability. If you have an underweight kid, we have a program like that at Radies where we can put people in the hospital for a couple of weeks uh, if they're really medically unstable, but it's not a long-term kind of treatment. Just to say a few words about what we're doing in our program, just as a kind of a model, we actually don't believe in long-term overnight stays. We want kids to live at home with their families. We want them exposed to the stress and dealing with you know, family issues every day and also the family dealing with their eating behavior so that you know, we can work with the families. You know, we, we actually, in our day treatment program, which is up to 10 hours a day, six days a week, we uh, have about uh, 12 to 15 hours a week of just family uh, patient interactions, uh, often around food and eating, but also around kind of emotional kind of regulation and, and, and talking with each other. Um, just to say, we actually use a family-based treatment model that was devised by Ivan Eisler. I, Ivan actually is the uh, principal architect at FBT at Mosley, and he's been a visiting professor at UCSD for a number of years. And so we've put his uh, second-generation uh, multifamily approach into, into uh, action in our program. Uh, and we have a number of certified FBT trainers, and the reason I I say that is that this is a difficult treatment to learn. You can't really learn it successfully in a weekend. It takes a long time. So we actually have a college where we have we set aside you know uh, several weeks to just train our, our new staff in FBT, and then everybody goes through continuous weekly supervision uh, with with our certified trainers to make sure that they are adhering to the principles of FBT and delivering uh, competent treatment. And we only hire full-time staff, rather the part-time staff, so that we make sure that people are fully trained. Uh, and we have expertise in other uh, evidence-based treatments. So what do we mean by evidence-based treatments? You're going to hear a lot about this today. And this is a treatment where there's some literature showing that it actually is effective, that it had, compared to some other treatment or other kinds of ways of approaching it, that it has a certain efficacy. And we know if you apply this, a certain proportion of people are going to get better. None of these are, you know, are going to, effect, are going to be effective for everybody, but they, they will uh, be useful for some pop, group of population. And the other thing that's very important is to publish your results. So we publish our long-term results, and we want to say, look, it's, you know, it's important to say most people are doing better when they're discharged. That's not useful. What you want to know is a year later, two years later, are people still doing well? That's really what, you know, what's necessary. Uh, we have separate programs for children, adolescents, and adults. Uh, where we treat about uh, 70 to 80 people a day in our program. Uh, so we're, the, we're probably the largest single site program in California. And, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, we, we actually have two FBT programs. One is this day treatment program uh, up to 10 hours a day, six days a week. The other one is that we have a week-long intensive family uh, immersion kind of course. So if you don't live in San Diego, um, you can come for a week and you can get kind of a, an immersion in FBT and learn, and learn how to do that. That's a multifamily uh, uh, program. And it's, we also have published data on that. We see about 90% of people at two and a half years afterwards are either fully or partially recovered. And uh, 
So the final thing I want to say is the importance of really using um, uh, neurobiology and science to really kind of drive treatment approaches. And you know, uh, that's really the future of behavior. As we have these tools now, brain imaging, genetics, stem cells, things like that, to really begin to understand you know, the pathways and molecular biology of the brain and how behavior is encoded in the brain, we and others are using this now to devise new treatment approaches that really are kind of based on science. And, and this is really the future, and this is, again, you know, what AIM is so very interested in supporting is this integration of science and treatment delivery. Um, so it's helping us understand you know, this altered ten temperament and cognition and, and strategies that people with eating disorders use. Uh, they're related to anxiety and uh, disturbed reward and oversensitivity to punishment and difficulties with learning. Um, and we're using this to, to really improve, uh, improve our treatment. We're also trying to repurpose medications. You know, with human beings, you can't just give them anything you want. It has to be FDA approved. But there are medications out there that haven't been used for eating disorders. As we begin to understand the molecular biology of the brain better, it's giving us clues as to new medication approaches. And we publish a lot of data. And just to give you an idea here, so this is a, from our adult program uh, of people with anorexia and and uh, they came in underweight. This is their weight. So the darker blue is their weight at admission. The medium blue is their weight at discharge. And the lighter blue is their weight, I think it was a year later, yeah, 12 months later. Uh, I will say that, uh, you know, as we were talking about yesterday, it, we have problems like everybody else does with following people up. You can't get the entire sample uh, to respond. So, you know, it's, it's a bit flawed because there's a group of people we just can't measure outcome on. But still, the people that we are able to measure it on, we're seeing you know, long-term kind of successes. So um, I'm going to stop there, and I think there's maybe a little bit of time for some questions. So, Because unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave today and return to San Diego. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you to you who have uh, submitted questions. Dr. K, we yeah. have three. All right. I'll start out with the first uh, from a parent of a 14-year-old. Yeah. Mom says, my 14-year-old daughter has been diagnosed with anorexia and is strongly exhibiting symptoms of oppositional defiance disorder, yeah. ODD. Is there a link between EDs and ODD? And mom also notes that uh, the ODD symptoms are primarily being manifested to parents only. Yeah. This is really pretty common, and you know, whatever you want to call it. And you know what we tend to see is this is you know this resistant to, to treatment, uh, to eating and gaining weight, and this is a very frustrating disorder for people because you work so hard, and we, we certainly experience this as clinicians. You work so hard to get people with anorexia to eat and gain weight, and they'll often look at you and say, "You just ruined my life." And so you know they have a very different perspective on it. And you know I will say, and you, you just kind of have to work through that. That's Unfortunately, just part of dealing with the illness. I have to tell you, I've been in this business a long time, and I have the, uh, uh, you know, what I've seen is I've been able to see people, what happens to them 10 years later. And I've never seen anybody with anorexia that's recovered that has been anything other than grateful for their parents, you know, pushing them, insisting they be in treatment. And what they'll say to you when they're 24 years old and they've recovered, they'll say, you know, I don't know why I was acting that way. I couldn't help myself. Thank you for, you know, um, making me get treatment. And they're really grateful. They repair all the problems of the family. So, you know, you're going to get a lot of resistance. You just kind of have, it's part of the illness. Uh, you know, you just have to kind of deal with it, you know, and, and, but just insist on treatment, not give into it. Good advice. I'm on a lot of parent groups and I, I hear that a lot. Yeah. So thank you for that response. Another parent uh, comments, yeah. lots of people are very skinny, yeah. health conscious and mindful of what they eat. How do you recommend young people with this profile help themselves so that they don't develop full-blown eating disorders? You know, this is, uh, there certainly is a spectrum here. And um, this is always kind of an issue exactly what is the cutoff? You know, where, when do you become concerned? 
Um, and and this, is, this is really kind of difficult. You know, if somebody has extreme eating disorders, it's pretty clear if it's, you know, partial, then, you know, you know, one of the things is, uh, are they having problems w with menses? When, when girls lose enough weight, they'll stop having r regular menstrual periods, and that in itself has a lot of consequences on kind of the brain and the body. So that's one of the ways to look at it, but I think it's also the other symptoms. How are they having problems with anxiety? Are they having problems with body image? Are they, uh, are they functioning well? Uh, you know, sometimes we see people with anorexia, they function very well in school in terms of grades, but they're having problems with social interactions and things like that. So it's, it, there's a, you know, it's not just one thing. It's really kind of the big picture. Mm -hmm. Great response. Thank you. Final questions yeah. from a friend. Sure. If I suspect my friend has an eating disorder, mm -hmm. how should I approach her in a way that is supportive but firm and doesn't enable the behavior? Yeah, this is, this is the hardest question of all, and we get this all the time. And um, it's, you know, there is... You know, I think it's it's very important to be supportive, and 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 try and do what you can to get people with eating disorders to get into treatment. Uh, but to, this can be sometimes a very difficult kind of ship to turn around. And I think that you know, maintaining an understanding that this isn't volitional, it's not manipulation, it's something that they can't help doing. And that, uh, you know, there is a learning curve here, but sometimes with people with anorexia, it's slow. So, yeah, let me also mention one of the, I'm sorry I have to leave, but I've, I've got some issues going on at UCSD. I've got, I want to try and get back this afternoon. Um, I'm certainly available by phone or email. We have, uh, you know, myself or our staff are very, you know, willing to talk with you. And, uh, you know, we can do a phone appointment and, uh, you know, answer some of your questions or do evaluations or anything that you, that you need. So. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Thank you so much, and thank you again for those insightful questions. I think um, my interactions with people leading up to, the, to, uh, to this event is that's really the core of why they're here. They want to get their questions asked, so please don't be, don't be shy about submitting your questions. And I, I, I hope that you will take Dr. K up on uh, his offer to follow up uh, if you don't want to have a face-to-face -face conversation, if you prefer a little more private engagement, dis discreet engagement. Um, I think you will see that, as I mentioned before, their genuine care and compassion for, for kids really comes through, and he's sincere about that offer. I am very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Kate Fitzgerald. She co-directs the Pediatric Anxiety Disorders Clinic and serves as academic director for child and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Michigan. Her current research involves using functional MRI, or the, the images of the, the brain scans that you see, uh, measuring electric, uh, excuse me, uh, measuring electric, <laughs> I don't know why this is so hard, electrical activity, say it, electrical activity, in the brain, um, and then uh, targeting um, direct markers that can be used to um, hone in on specific innovative treatments for childhood anxiety disorders. She's also involved in research focused on the dissemination of currently available treatments and interventions for these conditions. She's particularly interested in how cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, as you've heard before, improves brain function in anxious youth, and is also involved in research focusing on dissemination of CBT in schools. So you parents out there, pay attention. She she really has a lot of great information for you. So, Dr. Kate Fitzgerald. Thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. It is a delight to be able to be here today and um, speak with all of you. Um, so I'm going to jump into my presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a project that AIM funded. And um, just to kind of launch the, the discussion, I, I just want to thank AIM for really um, 
both bringing me here, but also making this work possible. Um, as you heard from Walter Kay, there are great treatments out there already, but there's still many um, kids who don't respond to the treatments that we currently have available. So the work that AIM is doing is so important to try to develop even better treatments um, to help children when they're very young. Um, and so just to start, we all know that anxiety serves a purpose. Um, sort of back in the day of, of the caveman, you would see you know, a monster, a, a dinosaur, a, a big animal out there, and you would run. You would feel this fight or flight response, you know, let, let's you know, get me out of here quick. Um, anxiety serves a purpose by pumping the blood to your muscles so you can activate that, that, that fleeing when it's appropriate. In this day and age, we're not seeing many dinosaurs anymore, but there are times that it might be appropriate to, to run if you really see something that, that's scary. You're out there in a dark night and you know, sort of a bad guy approaches you. Still, that doesn't happen too, too commonly. But even if you shift into what we do encounter in everyday life, anxiety still serves a purpose. Anxiety is this thing that kind of lets you know, this is something I care about. This is something I want to motivate so I can do well at it. And so here you see in um, the picture, you know, examples of this in children. Um, if you have anxiety kind of just enough, it may give you that little bit of care. So you study hard for the test so you can do well. So you practice the piano so you can play it in the performance. But where does anxiety kind of cross from being normative and and maybe appropriate and serving a function um, to a disorder um, that is getting in the way. Um, really, it's when that anxiety becomes intense, inappropriate. It's there's no bad guy, there's no dinosaur, or you know, even though you performed well on that test, you know, a hundred times before, the anxiety is so strong that it's distracting you from being able to study. Um, frequent, it doesn't go away. It's day after day after day. Um, distressing, and of course difficult to control. So what do I mean by anxiety that's getting in the way? This is the anxiety that crosses into an illness. These might be kids who, um, uh, when, when studying, you know, they become so anxious that they can't focus, they're irritable towards other. These might be kids who, very young, you know, the laundry is clean and you touched it, and now it's contaminated. Um, it doesn't make sense, but maybe it's causing interference with the family life. These might be kids who, on the first day of school, everybody feels a little bit nervous, but the kids that they stay nervous day after day and, and are unable to attend school. So how common is this type of anxiety that's really getting in the way of function? Our functioning socially, with our family, academically. Um, it turns out um, not only is it very common, um, but this type of anxiety that gets in the way starts early. Um, so what you see here is a community sample that was done in about 400 preschoolers. And um, in the first column, these are age three years old, these are age six years old. And you can see that as young as age three, as many as 20% um, were experiencing clinically significant anxiety that was getting in the way of their function. And that anxiety was more common than any other type of illness at this young age of three, more common than ADHD, much, much more common than depression. Depression. As you move into six years of age, anxiety remained the most common, still 15%, although depression becoming a little bit more common, and you can see down here um, other problems, um, you know, kind of in the range of approximately 10%. But my point here is, is this anxiety that gets in the way not only is common, but it starts early. Um, and so then you wonder, all right, well, that's kind of shocking that it's that common. Who do these anxious kids actually grow up to be? Um, we know by the, the time of adolescence that one in three children, 33%, um, will have experienced a clinically significant anxiety disorder. And while these illnesses do predict risk for a host of different outcomes that we do not want to see, whether it's depression, substance abuse, school dropout, even suicide, we also know that many kids overcome the anxiety and do just fantastic. Um, some of the, the leaders in our society, whether it's in media, whether it's in sports, whether it's in politics, are individuals who suffered from anxiety and or depression, but learned to manage it. 
So what we're doing with AIM funding is trying to understand, are there ways that we can facilitate brain maturation so that young children who maybe have clinically significant anxiety getting in the way early can follow this trajectory of development to where they manage that anxiety to achieve their full potential. Um, so how, how can we help? Um, I, I was mentioning with AIM that we're attempting to develop uh, new interventions, but what are the interventions we have already? Um, the interventions that um, we have and, and that do work for many kids um, include ones that Walter mentioned, including, oops, I meant to, sorry, going back here, sorry people, um, cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, um, medications such as sertraline, abbreviated here, CERT, and many times delivered in combinations, cognitive behavior therapy and sertraline together. And the data that I'm showing you here is from a study a little over 10 years old now that was conducted at many different sites in slightly older kids, seven to 18 years of age. And what this study found was really exciting. It's that if you combined cognitive behavior therapy and a medication, sertraline, um, as many as 80% got better. Um, what you're going to hear in a little bit from um, another speaker, David Clark, is um, probably what many of you know already, is that many families, well, yeah, they want, they want their child to get better. They would prefer if it would be a psychotherapy rather than a medication, at least to start. And in this age group, these seven to 18 year old kids, we found, or it was found, that um, when you look at CBT alone, approximately 60% got better, so pretty good. But 40% is still a lot of kids who, who weren't benefiting from treatment. And what we find if you downward extend to even younger ages, is the, the very youngest, the, the four to six year olds that you know anxiety may start so early, um, tend to respond even less well to cognitive behavior therapy. Um, why might that be? Um, we believe the active ingredient of cognitive behavior therapy is practicing the things that make you afraid until they stop being so scary anymore. Um, so, for example, the, the, the fear of a bug, you know, approaching a bug over and over and over again to lo and behold, your brain kind of figures out, you know, that bug isn't going to hurt me. But in order to do that, in order to do this kind of behavioral practice, you have to be able to feel the fear and do it anyways. That do it anyways comes from the frontal cortical part of the brain that is still very immature in young kids, four to six year olds, um, that, that we're most interested in in the, the context of the study I'm about to present. So it stands to reason that these might be the kids that are least likely to benefit from CBT because they have difficulty mobilizing that, if you will, effortful control to engage in this practicing of you know, approaching the feared stimulus until it stops being so scary. So what do we need? Um, obviously, um, it would be nice to have a more variety of treatments, better treatments, um, ones that are more effective than 50%, ones that work better for um, children even when they're very, very young. Um, but, but let's take it back to a story. So here we have, a, say, a five-year-old girl who um, she's on her first day of, of kindergarten. And like most five-year-old girls or boys, it's going to be a little bit anxiety-provoking. This is a new place. I have to separate from mom and dad. I have to maybe learn something that's going to be hard. I have to meet new kids. Um, what we're trying to do is... Uh, develop with an intervention, again funded by AIM, that kind of do it anyways. I'm going to go on into the school because maybe something good is going to happen. I might meet new friends, I might master some skills. Um, th there's something uh, rewarding, attractive enough about school to overcome the fear as opposed to wanting to avoid it entirely and, and just running away. And this is really an example of um, a common symptom we see in these preschool age kids is when that fear gets too too much, when it sort of crosses the line to um, an illness, you will see school refusal, sort of pulling out all the stops because that anxiety feels so awful, I don't have the do it anyways in me and I'm just going to avoid. So 
how do you measure the do it anyways? How do you measure that effortful control, that thing in the brain, that function in the brain that we'd like to promote? So, you know, kids could benefit more from cognitive behavior therapy. Maybe they wouldn't even need CBT in the first place if, if you could sort of facilitate brain maturation to, to um, have this effortful control on hand. Um, so what we're doing in our lab is we're measuring this brain capacity um, using an electrophysiologic index or an EEG marker called the error-related negativity. So what is EEG? The, the kids wear a little cap that measures electrical activity coming from the brain, and um, they play a game while they're, they're, they're wearing this cap. And it's just a simple cognitive game that kind of forces them to make a simple cognitive mistake, not even related to the anxiety. When a child or anyone makes a simple cognitive mistake, um, this error signal, the, the, what we're using to index effortful control, the do it anyways, um, comes from the midline portion of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. So here's the front of, front of the brain and kind of running right in the midline is the, this anterior cingulate cortex or ACC. This region of the brain turns on activates when you make a mistake. And it does so for a reason. It's detecting that mistake appropriately so you can go on and adjust your behavior. You might think about in anxiety, what makes that kid go into the school instead of running away? Perhaps in the level of the brain, there is a detection of, you know, maybe this is not so bad. Maybe there are more positive things at school. This is almost like a thinking error that I can go on and, and go ahead and go in the doors, mobilizing that effortful control. What do we know about the error-related negativity and anxiety, or OCD? Why is this even an index of effortful control that we care about when we're studying um, these illnesses? Well, we know from research in adolescents and adults that this ERN, this error signal, is bigger in adult patients with OCD and even in adolescents with OCD, um, as, as well as other types of anxiety disorders. Um, so if it's bigger, you know, our first thought when we discovered this, and it was probably almost 20 years ago, was, well, maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe too much of this error signal is kind of like a, oh, crap response, an effective response to making a mistake, maybe driving the anxiety. But as we've begun to understand more and more about this error signal, um, the thinking about it has shifted a little bit to, well, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe what the ERN is doing is signaling for this effortful control, an appropriate detection of this is a thinking error, not like an error that's going to hurt me. And I need to detect it so I can adjust my behavior and march on into school. Um, and indeed, if you look at the relationship between the error-related negativity and anxiety in younger children, so that the age group that we're interested in studying, there seems to be this developmental story. Whereas I mentioned previously, this error signal seems to go with, you know, too large of an error signal seems to go with anxiety in adulthood. As you move downward in age to young children, this error signal seems to be reduced in anxiety. The less error signaling you get, the more anxiety you have. How might that map onto brain development and how might that be harnessed to build a better treatment? Um, so what I'm doing here is just taking you through a, a little bit of brain science and how that might um, be thought about from a developmental standpoint. So here you have an adult we think that from based on studies, they had this too big of an error signal. Um, we know also that you know, it may not be the error signal itself that is generating the anxiety. Rather, whether you're an adult or you're a child, it's this little almond-shaped thing called the amygdala. It kind of sits right behind the ear um, here that is often found to be hyperactive in anxious brains. And again, across development, whether you're a child, an adolescent, or adult. So this amygdala is widely believed to signal threat, fear, reactivity. And um, it may be that this signal, when it's not appropriate, is being detected as an error signal 
so that that anterior cingulate cortex, which is kind of this pinkish region here, can signal in adults to bring online more effortful control. Um, a function that we believe um, derives not just from the signaling for it from the ACC, but from other regions of the frontal cortex. So in this case, what I'm trying to show is you may have a problem in adults with anxiety whereby that error signal is for some reason not getting through to the parts of the brain that mobilize and bring on this effortful control so you can do it anyways. That's in adulthood. When you've had the opportunity for more anterior cingulate, for more of this frontal cortex to come online, move back towards childhood again. Um, it may be in children, because they have yet to mature their brain, that just by driving up this error signal, you may be able to bring online more effortful control. And this is kind of the theory behind this, this work that I'm about to, to show you, is that we may need to drive up this error signal to bring online more effortful control so children with anxiety or OCD can overcome it. Um, so back to our little girl at school. Um, I kind of alluded this or to this already, but um, the child that's able to think, you know, I need a coping strategy here. I, I know I have to go to school. My body is telling me I'm anxious and I kind of want to run away, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go in. What is it that it's this effortful control that's making them go in? And here is my example of this little girl thinking, well, coping skill, I'll put on my best dress and my necklace and, and and, and, and I go. Um, and the idea is that by being able to mobilize effortful control is how you bring that coping skill online. And by driving up effortful control, we may overcome fear, you know, that reactivity in the amygdala. Um, how are we doing this in our study? Well, we have developed an intervention designed to um, drive up effortful control. We think it's going to drive up this um, error signal, the ERN in the brain, um, and we're measuring it before and after the intervention, um, that ERN, as well as a, a fear marker, which is a, a blink reflex in the eye that is believed to map onto that amygdala reactivity to threat. Um, what are we doing to, to hopefully shift this balance, drive up the effortful control, and thereby drive down the, the anxiety, the fear reactivity? Um, we're delivering kids um, games that are done in kind of in a camp-like setting. So four to six clinically anxious preschoolers come and play games that require effortful controls. Even more importantly, they require kids to make mistakes and keep trying to overcome the mistakes so that they can learn to play the games better. What are these games? These are games that you guys have played, that I've played, that our kids all play. Simple games, Simon Says, Red Light, Green Light. Games that require you to stop a response, to detect a mistake if you don't stop the response, and to correct it. Um, all games that build that, um, both the anterior cingulate or ACC error response um, in terms of bringing on effortful control from other areas of the frontal cortex. Um, and what are we finding? Well, AIM um, funding allowed us to collect this data in about 30 kids. Um, so we had about six different camps, each one of them, again, approximately five kids each. Um, and before and after the, the camp-like intervention, we measured both their behavioral capacity for effortful control by playing um, little behavioral games that um, tap your ability to do hard thinking or cognitively difficult tasks, um, measured the error-related negativity, and measured anxiety. Um, so in this work, I'm just showing you very preliminary results, and, and this is something you'll, you'll hear scientists say we're always very cautious. This is a small sample. Um, this is just a, a new intervention that we're kind of doing a proof of concept, but we were able to show that from before to after this, effortful controlled training game intervention, that error signal, the ERN, error-related negativity, went up. Um, their effortful control behaviors as measured by um, basically computer tasks. You might know the word neuropsychological tasks. These are common tests that are used to measure kids' ability to think. 
um, also increased, something called the dimensional card um, sort task and a different thing called the flanker task. These are just um, names of different tests that are used to measure effortful control. And then in addition, the anxiety went down. Um, so where next? As I mentioned, this is a very small pilot study. We're delighted that AIM was um, able to, to give us the ability to do it through funding it. But the next step will be um, working harder so that we can collect the ERN and more of the kids. These are kids that are squirmy, wearing that EEG cap kind of feels uncomfortable, strange. So we're developing strategies so we can collect more data and more kids before and after. Um, we're also developing a parenting component. So linking back to um, Walter Kay's point that um, you, um, in building effortful control, need to build it into the environment. So who, who's the environment for kids? It's parents. Can parents work at home with their children Children to practice these games to um, make the skills even stronger and, and potentially more durable over time. Um, thirdly, where next? Um, really a randomized control trial is the gold standard in science. So we don't know is the reason maybe that these kids seem to get a little bit better better in their bigger ERN, their more effortful control, and their less anxiety because of the cognitive training games that we delivered? Or was it simply by being in an environment with other kids and nice camp counselors and um, that encourage them and help them separate from mom and dad? So a randomized controlled trial means we'll take um, clinically anxious kids, and some will get just like a play group, and some will get the camp with these effortful control training games to see if truly there's a difference. Um, even step beyond that, predictor outcomes. Is it true that if you start with too low of an error-related negativity, you're somebody who's more likely or less likely to benefit from this training? And even more so, we know that it's not this ACC and this error signaling alone that's working to help anxiety. It's also the amygdala, that reactivity to threat, potentially also reward mechanisms. I went into school because I was excited I might be able to meet some new friends. So I think next steps for this work is building training interventions, not only to increase effortful control, but also to understand which individual child may have sort of which levels of which one of these functions, effortful control, fear reactivity, reward processing, and building treatments that will be more customized to individual children so that we can get them in more personalized ways better. So, all of this is a little bit pie in the sky, but they're exciting ideas of where the science could go next um, to help kids with interventions that may be stronger and better acting than the interventions we have currently available. And all of this really cannot be done without foundations like AIM um, to help bring new science um, into practice um, so it can help real children. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. I want to mention that we are uh, broadcasting live all over the globe. AIM is going global. And our guests from across the country and across the nation are submitting questions for you, Dr. Fitzgerald. Nope. Uh, they're submitting their questions now for the, for the group panel. Um, but that's really exciting. Um, and I want to, I want to cue you up for the thought that part of the deconstruction of the stigma associated with youth mental health and mental health in general is talking about it as a community, a community who cares, a community who cares about children and families. Um, so we want to take a break right now so that you can share your thoughts, your questions with other participants. Um, maybe get to interact with uh, Dr. Fitzgerald and um, queue up your questions. We have um, uh, yummy bagels and coffee from our friends at Carmel Valley Roasters who are so generous and supporting us this morning. So take a break and come back in 10 minutes, submit your questions, and we'll see you then. Thank you. <laughs>